Welcome everyone to another episode in our FH conversation series. Our last conversation in the early weeks of COVID-19 uh, discussed the immediate impact of COVID-19 on society and business, examined some recent data on how COVID, uh, how consumers and business are reacting uh, to, to the crisis. Uh, and we also offered some initial guiding principles um, to organizations that they should consider in the communications planning. You know, since then, we've had, uh, we're still not only managing through the COVID crisis, but we're also addressing the incredibly important issue of social injustice. Uh, today, our session is going to discuss how organizations can gear up their communications for the fall, a period full of key uh, moments, including the commitment march that's occurring on Friday, uh, the return to school and campus uh, activity that started up and will continue through the next few weeks, the presidential election that's coming up, and more as society still grapples with the impact of COVID-19. Our panelists today, uh, will, including some of our own FH client partners, will provide a look ahead at these issues coming at us in the fall, what organizations can expect, and how they can prepare. And now I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Francamano, SVP and partner here in Boston, uh, to guide us through today's discussion. Great. Sarah. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm thrilled to have so many of you here today. I'd like to first introduce the panel of experts that we've assembled for you. First on our list is Bia Acevedo. She is an FH colleague of mine out of New York. She's a founding member of our Mosaic team, which is our DE&I experts. Next, we have Katie Scott. She's the head of global communications at Iron Mountain. Then we have Kathy O'Reilly, senior press officer at Phillips. Kelly Lynch, VP of Strategic Initiatives and Chief of Staff at Babson College, and Diane Pelker, SVP and partner out of our St. Louis office, who will share some insights from our true global intelligence team. So we are living in very uncertain times, extraordinarily uncertain. And as we move into the fall, organizations around the globe will need to manage their communications through ongoing issues that continue to impact society and also plan for key moments on the horizon. So at Fleischmann Hillard, we lead communications through very data-driven strategy and intelligence. We help our clients find the truth about their audiences, the operating environment, and their competition, helping them realize their communication goals. In some new research that we have just released last month, we attempted to chart a path forward by asking difficult questions that show that new reality for companies, your narratives, your workplaces, and how they're deeply interconnected with societal issues. And here are some of our key findings. The collision of global issues has elevated systemic racism, discrimination, and violence among women. Companies have an obligation to demonstrate real action and advocacy because their employees and their customers have higher expe expectations than ever. All aspects of the world have changed. Where public health and safety have become a priority over personal needs, this reality is now igniting future health and financial challenges and burdens for countries and consumers to face. Third, the pandemic has shifted consumers' outlook significantly and many believe their lives might even be more challenging six months from now compared to April. Consumers see the world as even riskier than ever before. Consumers believe the path to recovery is a long one, and I think we're all feeling this. They're all looking for acknowledgement of those challenges rather than an overly optimistic promise of an undefined future. You have kids going back to school, I'm sure you feel that right now. The end of the pandemic is more complicated than a single solution. The vaccine may not necessarily be the singular so solution so many are hoping or expecting it to be. And finally, safety is a work in progress in the medical community, the one true north that we rely on for direction. This uncertainty makes being safe as a final destination both unattainable and unrealistic. So we painted a kind of gloom and doom image there, but all is not lost. The enduring nature of this pandemic has become a, the new normal, like I said, with no single solution that will make all consumers feel the threat to them personally is gone. 
we keep calling it the new normal. I keep trying not to call it that, but it is. The pandemic has quickly uncovered health disparities, stigmas, and discrimination where some lives are saved while others are not. This falls on the backdrop of global systemic racism, discrimination, and violence. The needs of the world populations are real with consumers challenged financially. Despite this, this aching of humanity, many believe governments and companies globally are potentially opening too quickly, while still one out of five individuals will still not wear a mask to protect others unless it's either government, government mandated or not at all. And some of the data on this dashboard shows all of the um, information that we've collected. Two of the main ones that I wanna point out today is 80% say the pandemic has changed how they see the world. And this is not gonna flip back once there's a vaccine or once we can all stop wearing masks or our kids go back to school full time. And 72% say discrimination, equality, and racism is the most important issue. And 59% of those expect companies to take a stand on it. Now, while COVID-19 will have significant and lasting impact on almost every area of our lives, the world is also addressing the issue of racism, discrimination, and violence. To talk more about that, I'd like to bring on my colleague, as I mentioned earlier, earlier Pia Acevedo out of our New York office. Again, she is a founding member of Mosaic. That is FH's D, E, and I experts. Pia? Sarah, thank you so much um, for setting the stage for us in terms of the context and the landscape that we're all operating in. I think the point that you were just making about COVID-19 and the way that this convergence of the global pandemic and the racial justice reckoning has changed the way that people think, has caused us to realize in certain cases where we have privileges that aren't the same for everyone else um, in the country. I think it's been a real moment of self-awareness. Um, and so if I could just talk through some of the key themes that we've seen in the conversation, and I'll actually start with the second one. You know, I would say that sort of towards the end of February, early March, we started to see that this pandemic was not going to be the great equalizer that some people had thought. We sort of had thought that it would affect everybody the same. And it quickly became apparent that actually it wasn't doing that, that there was a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And the only explanation for that was systemic racism built into everything from um, our education systems, housing systems, um, the way the economy is structured, um, health disparities, all of those things were factors in why people of color in America were being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And then into that into that situation um, came George Floyd's murder and the protests and anger and frustration and pain um, that we've seen expressed. And again, just over these last couple of days with what happened to Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. So there is within the conversation about social justice, a clear focus on police reform and criminal justice reform. But I think it's also important to note that there are a lot of intersections to that conversation. Um, technology is one. There has been a lot of debate for some time now about the role of facial recognition um, in policing, in law enforcement, um, and so questions are being asked about that. Um, there are other social justice things, um, you know, in conversations around housing, education, some of the other disparities um, where the results and the harm of systemic racism show up. Economic inequity um, is an important one. You know, we talk a lot about the wealth gap, particularly between white and black Americans. And that gap, despite many sort of tests of policy initiatives, um, sort of one-off solutions to try and address it, um, is actually widening. And so as we think about maybe not the next normal, but what comes next. I think um, people are looking to see meaningful change, meaningful progress, some innovative thinking, and frankly, some solutions that deliver um, just deeper and more meaningful results. There is, in the media landscape, um, versions of this conversation pulling through. The media landscape was already fairly fragmented as a result of the pandemic. You know there have been a lot of pressures on the media to determine what's the right business model and how do we reach audiences how do we move online lots of um things like that and the pandemic has accelerated and, and fractured some of that 
Um, we also see media really picking up their accountability role, that sort of fourth estate institutional role, um, and keeping businesses honest. There are so many trackers now about what companies have done, what they've not done, how much, um, how many donations they've made. There's an incredible statistic that between George Floyd's murder at the end of May and roughly four weeks after that, um, there were $2 billion in donations to racial justice causes and organizations as compared to 166 million for the entire of 2019. So I think that shows um, the urgency that's been felt, but also poses the question of what are we going to have to show for this action in 12 months time, in six months time, in five years time. So accountability is going to be a really important part and the media are playing their role in keeping um, in keeping companies to account. And then the last thing there is really reporters are people too. And so to Sarah's point about um, you know, this moment changing how we see the world, it has also changed the way that we see the other people that we relate to. You know, we work in a calm space with reporters all the time. I've had lots of conversations with black reporters about what it has been like to work at this moment in time, either because you're covering COVID or because, um, you know, you're just living through the weight of what this racial justice reckoning is about. Um, so I think all of those things are, are important. Um, Moving ahead, this is the week that we are um, going to experience the March on Washington. Um, 57 years after Dr. King shared his dream with the world, I think we have been reminded, painfully so, that this dream has not been fully realized yet. Um, and I'll share just a personal anecdote quickly. I realized two weeks ago that I had never read the full text of the speech. Um, if that's your case too, I would, I would suggest reading it. There's a lot there. I have a dream is, is one component, but I think he talks a lot about the urgency of now, and that urgency is as relevant today as it was 57 years ago. So we're going to see on Friday um, the families of people who have lost loved ones to police brutality, George Floyd, Eric Garner's families, many others, unfortunately. Um, and so this is a solemn moment to really think about um, the civil rights agenda, what it means to, treat, to have equity in a society, and how we can advance that. Um, I mentioned uh, Jacob Blake. This is the latest high profile incident of a white police officer shooting an unarmed black man. Um, there have been a fresh wave of protests. The conversation has changed a little bit um, because Jacob is expected to live. Um, so it's added a little bit of dimension. Um, we're seeing a lot of conversation around whether or not videos um, of these incidents should really be widely shared. On the one hand, there's an argument that this is how we know what's happening and we hold people to account. But there is also increasingly a strain of the conversation that says, you know, sharing these videos without more careful considerations starts to normalize the behavior and that is also a problem. Um, so I think this is a good moment for organizations to think about what they've learned since between you know George Floyd's murder and this latest um, incidents of violence um, and how the way they think about their responses and their actions has changed. Um, the March on Washington does have political undertones. I think fundamentally the core purpose of it is not political. Um, to talk about um, creating an equitable, an equitable society is not inherently political, but there are policy agendas at play. And so companies, as they consider how they're going to activate and how they're going to support the march, um, need to think about just their track record, how political they've been in the past, where their leader stands, um, any contributions they may have made that are on public record um, to different political parties, candidates. I think it's just important to have that information at hand and know where you stand even if you don't communicate about it. And then finally, you know, what happens next? This is an important and historic moment, but it is a moment. And I think what many stakeholders are looking for is the long-term view. This moment needs to be a movement. There needs to be momentum behind it. And the only way you do that is through consistent forward action. Um, and so, you know, it's important for brands to really think about that. And in some ways, it's how you show up in the little moments when it's just about doing the right thing because you believe it's the right thing. Um, that really helps to strengthen your credibility with the most important stakeholders. And so a little bit more about what's going to come over the next couple of months. I would say, firstly, that we have a unique role as communicators and an ability to influence how our organizations and our colleagues are understanding these issues and how we're showing up. Communications can be a catalyst. Words matter. Stories are how many people understand the world. And so there's a real opportunity for us to leverage there. Um, John mentioned earlier the elections, you know, this is a highly charged election. The backdrop is deeply polarized and in the midst of a global pandemic with all the health and safety considerations that that implies. 
employers should really be thinking about how they can support employees and encourage civic engagement, but it has to be, to Sarah's point earlier, um, very grounded in the reality and the lived experience of those stakeholders. So, you know, when we talk about registering to vote, um, voter suppression, lack of access to polls, um, difficulty um, voting by mail, all of those things are real and companies that sort of push for civic engagement without acknowledging those realities are going to find that their efforts fall a little bit flat. Um, watching out for what we're sort of calling like a DNI fatigue. I think there are questions coming through about when does this conversation move on? When do we go back to the way it was before? When can we talk about other things? Um, you know, true genuine commitment to this is about intentional action all day, every day. Um, so there is no moving beyond that. It just needs, it's, it's DNI is not a thing you do, it's a way that you think. And so once you've changed your mindset, that is about sustained behavioral change. So I think for a lot of companies, you know, you want to be committed to doing the work in ways that are authentic to where you are. And just remember that where you start isn't where you have to end up. Um, and a part of that, of course, will be planning for 2021. This is the time when many organizations are starting to look at budgets, they're starting to think about what investments they're going to make, um, how they're going to navigate the, some of the economic fallout of the pandemic. I think this is the time to make a clear decision about whether or not DNI is going to move to the center of the business. And that means really looking at the way the business is run, the processes, the systems, to determine, first of all, if any of those things are driving inequities in any way, and if they are, how they can be addressed. And to really be committed to the time, the energy, um, and in some cases, many cases, the financial resources that are going to be necessary um, to make progress. So I'm going to stop there. Um, you know, I, and along with 50 plus Mosaic counselors are available um, to consult and provide perspective. Um, we're happy to do so. These are important conversations. They're conversations that will be ongoing. Um, so feel free to reach out to me directly or through Sarah. And I'll turn it back over to her now. Thanks so much, Bia. That was really insightful. I appreciate you being able to join us today. Next up, and we can scooch ahead up to Kathy O'Reilly from uh, Phillips. So if we can scooch ahead a couple on the slides up to Phillips, and then we'll work Katie back into the system. All right, here we go. Here we go, Kathy. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, you'll be talking about hey, COVID-19. So yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Hopefully you can hear me, yes? Very good. All right. Well, hey, everybody. I'm Kathy O'Reilly. I'm one of the senior press officers um, here at Phillips. So I've been in uh, PR and media relations for um, over 20 years now. And prior to my role in PR, I was a national television producer, uh, producing many entertainment news and uh, format programming for uh, the morning shows and syndicated programming throughout the U.S. So I've been in PR and media relations for um, quite a while, but I don't think anybody, as, as Sarah and Bia and others have already referenced, I don't think any of us were prepared. I don't think any level of experience uh, would have prepared us for what we've been dealing with over the past um, several months uh, due to the pandemic and other uh, issues around uh, social unrest and the po current political climate. Um, so just a little bit about Philips. Um, many of you may recognize the brand. Um, we are a leading health technology company. Um, I am actually working out of the Cambridge office these days, um, even though working from home. Uh, but our corporate headquarters are based in the Netherlands. This is a photo of our, our corporate HQ uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, we have uh, roughly 81,000 employees um, based in 100 uh, countries worldwide. So our mission um, as Philips is to really improve the lives of 3 billion people a year um, by 2030. And that mission has become more relevant than ever in the history of our company. And we've been around for 129 years. Um, due to the pandemic, um, we realized that we have a responsibility um, on many, many fronts to help do what we can to um, to work with both patients and our customers on the front lines. Um, at the onset of the pandemic, our executives, led by Franz Van Houten, who is our CEO of, of uh, Royal Phillips, 
uh, and his executive team really determined that we were going to establish a triple duty of care to ensure, first and foremost, the, the health and safety and well-being of our employees worldwide, especially those working on the front lines with our customers and other COVID patients. Um, continuing to fulfill um, the critical needs of our customers, um, obviously those, again, working on the front lines globally, and ensuring business continuity. And this triple duty of care will remain with us for, for many, many months and, and years to come as we work through this. Um, Philips does have a very broad portfolio of products and services and solutions um, that are really helping to address not only the preparedness and the response, but also the recovery needs um, of, uh, of, of our customers and patients that are working through the pandemic, specifically because of the, the, the nature of this being an uh, infectious respiratory disease. Um, COVID has really forced health systems and our customers to pivot and adapt very, very quickly. Again, nobody was prepared for this. And this is where telehealth has really come into play, things like home monitoring, remote patient monitoring. Um, and these are areas that Philips plays a huge role in. So again, we've had to really step up to deliver. Um, right now, our goal is to really help our customers as they move through these various phases. Um, many of them are experiencing unprecedented challenges. You probably see in the news every day, the financial constraints and various hospital systems closing. Um, it's causing a huge undue burden uh, while they're trying to deal with uh, this most you know, critical care period for patients. So we really need to work with them um, to help them become resilient, to introduce new business models, and really introduce the digitization of healthcare, particularly around huge challenging issues like interoperability, which we have seen first and foremost during the pandemic, um, that this has become a huge challenge. But because of where Philips plays in the industry and our huge area of focus in respiratory care and patient monitoring, particularly in critical acute areas of the hospital like the ICU, and due to the nature, again, of the respiratory um, impact of COVID, um, Phillips was front and center in the news from day one. Um, every time the president would mention in his press conferences anything about medical device companies stepping up, anything about Phillips or other um, companies around anything having to do with ventilator production, patient monitoring capabilities, the phone would ring off the hook. We were getting inundated with phone calls from media, not just here in the U.S., but globally. Dozens and dozens of calls were coming in every day, 24-7, seven days a week. It was overwhelming. And at any other given time, as a PR person, as a media relations um, professional, you would love that attention for your brand. You would be so ecstatic about the, the amount of coverage and attention you were getting. But this was really challenging for us because we did not have the answers to a lot of these questions that were coming in. This was the first for us, unprecedented. You're going to hear that mentioned many, many times during this webinar. But for us on the front lines with reporters, it was a huge challenge because people's lives were at stake. No matter what we said, we had to be accountable. So we had to be extremely careful with how we were responding to these to the, the reporters' inquiries. We were also a public company, and we had to be responsible to our stakeholders. Anything we said would have impacted our stock price and impacted the business in many, many ways. So we had to step back, and that wasn't easy because reporters were on deadline. At news, this is, nothing was being covered in the news but COVID. So we had to really step back, get together with our key stakeholders, our executives, our legal and regulatory teams, our HR teams, um, and all of our approved spokespeople, and really come up with a way to respond in due time. It was a, due, it was a huge challenge, we will say, um, because many of these reporters we had very close relationships with. I think Bia mentioned earlier, you know, many of the reporters of color that she deals with on a daily basis. We were dealing with all of these reporters um, before the pandemic, and it was getting frustrating for them and for us that we couldn't respond in, in, uh, in a quick way, but we had to step back. That was our responsibility to patients, to customers, to everyone to make sure we did the right thing. So what did we do? Right out of the gate, we had to establish a COVID rapid response team. Um, it was critical that we had aligned messaging, again, that was approved and was delivered in a very um, controlled way, if you will, 
So we had a one point person that would answer any of the messages from reporters once the messaging was approved. We did move through approvals very, very quickly, albeit not as quickly as we would have liked, but this is what we had to do to be responsible. Again, people's lives were at stake here. And we then expanded that. We realized it was not going to be sustainable to have one person. So we did add a few other folks to the crisis response team, but we also brought in um, other core key stakeholders for total alignment across corporate communications, legal and regulatory, executive comms, PR, social, internal communications. It was a huge challenge because not only do we have to respond to the, um, the increase coming in from reporters, but we also had to respond to our employees. We owed them first and foremost. Again, what could they communicate out to their customers? How could they communicate on social? What did we want them to say, not to say? What was appropriate? We also owed our customers communication. So we had to pull together the SWAT team of core stakeholders that, again, would immediately be able to approve these responses, and then we could go out in a very effective yet controlled manner. And not only did this have to happen in the U.S., but globally. Again, we have a presence in over in 100 countries worldwide. We were getting inundated with calls from, from all of our key stakeholders. So we created, again, this rapid response, this, this crisis comms team that came together with the core stakeholders. Um, we, we all worked together. This was a total cohesive effort. There was not one person. We had to do this in a very cohesive and ordered way. So we established a couple of things right out of the gate. Um, a COVID playbook, for example, and we still have this in, in, um, in play today. This is an internal document that Phillips created. We met at the beginning of the pandemic once a day with all of these core stakeholders across these key groups, including legal. And legal was a huge partner of ours in this effort. Um, but we also learned that we needed to work through approvals very, very quickly to be very lean and agile so that we could make things happen in a way and also be compliant. We wanted at, at any given time, at all time, we had to make sure that all of our quality and regulations and legal requirements were there. So while we were doing this very quickly, we never sacrificed on quality, and that was something we, con we continue to be super proud of. Um, we also established an external site, um, a global response site to COVID, which still exists today. It's on all of our dot-com pages, including the homepage of Phillips.com. So this was a place that we could point reporters to, other key stakeholders, industry analysts, customers, um, other thought leaders. Um, we could point them to this site, which contained everything from press releases to pre-recorded webinars, tutorial videos. Customers needed to know, how do I clean a ventilator quickly in the ICU so I'm not spreading the virus? How do I clean a patient monitor on the general floor ward as I'm having, you know, you know, as I'm having uh, patients coming through, moving through the hospital system. So all of this material was also available on our external site as well. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, Phillips was very invested and, and literally heading down to Orlando, Florida for the largest health IT event that's held globally each year, the HEMS event. We already had half of our team on site there. They were building the booth. We were ready to go. We had all of our PR, all of our communications, marketing, social, digital, huge investment for us. Literally at the 11th hour because of the pandemic, the HEMS organization canceled the event. What were we going to do then? So we had to pivot very, very quickly to a digital virtual experience, which we did. And again, it was because of these core crisis teams that we had in place and all of these people that were able to come together quickly for approvals. We were able to get the virtual site up and running within seven days. The HIMSS organization itself, it took them almost three weeks. So we were extremely um, proud and, again, total, total team effort. Um, lastly, I would say that we had to really work with reporters. How did we pivot from how we would normally work with media to how we were going to work with them now? They only wanted to cover COVID. We weren't going to be pitching them any other news that wasn't relevant to them. We also had to be extremely respectful of their time. Um, this also was, was hugely important during um, the beginning phases of the huge social unrest that started with the, with the George Floyd murder um, that Bia mentioned. And we wanted to make sure that we were being extremely respectful of reporters in their time, but also giving them what they needed in a timely fashion. And then how do you move from 
the, the reactive to the proactive in an orderly way, again, without appearing too opportunistic. That was a huge challenge. And I think we did it and continue to do it quite successfully because of the leadership within our global press office team and also the leadership within our executives. So how did the business react? Again, I think I've pointed to some of this already. Uh, people came together in unprecedented ways around this un un unprecedented time. Um, legal, HR, regulatory, PR, corpcom. We became um, a very lean and agile group. We continue to operate that way, and we're hoping that we'll continue to be able to leverage that um, those best practices that we've learned over the past several months. It also became clearly apparent that our employees wanted to do this. Um, people were working 24-7 around the clock. They were working on the production lines, creating, um, creating products that would help save lives globally, not just here in the U.S. So we can, we're, it, was, it was just a really incredibly and proud time to be a part of, of Philips, and, and it, we continue to be incredibly proud and, and really in awe of all, all of our um, fellow employees and our leadership team. So what lies ahead? Um, really, we're going to continue to learn. Uh, in addition to my role as a, a senior press officer within Philips, I am very proud to represent Philips as the board chair within the Social Media Business Council as part of socialmedia.org. So we're trying to bring best practices into the organization around huge crises that are occurring, learning from other brands. Do you participate in the Facebook boycott? Should we participate in Blackout Tuesday? Uh, what's lying ahead for the election? We're learning from others as we go along. We're learning about best practices with virtual events. We will continue to see what's working, what's not working. How can we continue to, to do this moving forward? Because this isn't going away. Many of the big events for 2021 have already been canceled. They're going to be happening, but they'll be happening digitally and virtually, including CES, the largest consumer electronics show in the world, which will be going all digital in January. Um, we'll also continue to adjust our cadence of publishing and content and our PR plans and our marketing plans because if anything uh, we've learned over the past several months, there's no guarantees and we don't know what the next wave will look like. Uh, Sarah mentioned we don't know what the new normal will look like. We just know that we'll continue to work and we'll deploy these best practices, including the agile and very lean ways of how we're working. We're hoping we'll continue to be able to learn from each other and deploy those best practices as we move forward. Um, for whatever lays ahead. So Sarah, thanks so much for the time and back over to you. Great, thanks Kathy. I'm exhausted just looking at all of what you did in a very short amount of time, so thank you for sharing that. So we are gonna try Katie again from Iron Mountain. We dialed her back in, let's see if the audio is working. Katie? We cannot, okay, we are going, oh, one more thing. Ah, I hear something. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Finally, give me. All right, give me let's go from slides back to our friends at Iron Mountain and let Katie take it from here. Are you all set to go? I am all set as long as you can hear me. We can. You're good. Go for it. All right. Well, thanks for having me. And it wouldn't be a good webinar if we didn't have some technical difficulties, of course. Uh, my name is Katie Scott. I'm the head of global communications for Iron Mountain, and my team is responsible for all internal and external communications events and reputation management. And before I jump into our, our COVID-19 response, let me just quickly uh, mention who we are as a company. Um, I'm sure you've seen many of our Iron Mountain trucks. Uh, on the road, uh, but we're more than just the Iron Mountain trucks. We're more than the document storage that we're uh, known for. We are a company of 25,000 employees. 75% uh, of our employees are frontline, so that really played into our communications response um, during the, the early days of the pandemic. Uh, we're on a growth journey as a company from physical storage to digital services and solutions, including our data centers, which um, are the only data centers that run completely on green power. Uh, we use AI and ML in digitizing and cataloging physical documents to meet the ever-changing current environment, um, such as digitizing mail rooms in the midst of office closures, uh, which was a really critical service for our, our government offices and insurance companies uh, during this time. Uh, we also have our art and entertainment services and our consumer storage uh, services. So we really do quite a lot um, that people don't, don't always know about. Um, 
We have a dynamic customer base, and we have 950 of the Fortune 1000 um, as our customers, and in total have about 225,000 customers from content studios to streaming services, celebrities who rely on us to store, manage, and dig digitize their content. Uh, and we serve many businesses uh, deemed essential, so we remained open during the crisis as an essential business. Uh, so for us, as a company, it's really about evolving and transforming in order to continue serving truly as our customers' most trusted partner uh, for protecting and unlocking the value of what matters most to them. And, and really, we aim to do that in innovative and socially responsible ways to uphold our values um, as a company. Uh, one last fact about the company itself is I don't know how many of you binge watch shows during quarantine. I'm sure if I could see a show of hands, everyone's hands would be raised. Um, but I, I know that we probably all did, and it's likely that an Iron Mountain employee helped digitize that content and manage the process to get it on your favorite streaming platform. So you're welcome. Um, so, all right, so let me jump into the topic at hand. How did we navigate communications during the acute days of 2019? So the slide that you're looking at right now, these next couple of slides are, are uh, thanks to the Fleischmann Hillard research team, and they really support the viewpoint that we held as a comms team. Um, as we planned and we aligned on communications during this time, our goal was to not only be perceived as being employee first, but to truly be employee first. And we knew that that it's a part of our company's DNA, and we wanted to make sure that we lived up to that and demonstrated that value. So what we, you know, one thing that we did know is that we didn't want to be one of the employers on the slide that's shown here on, at the bottom of the list uh, where we where we failed to show our commitment towards doing the right thing. We really, truly wanted to do good over just looking good. And I know uh, many of my colleagues on this call, that's exactly uh, the sentiment that you had. So on the next slide, it shows a little bit of a deeper look into the expectations customers and communities have on corporations and, and um, sp specifically as it comes to societal issues. As you know, there, are a lot of, there was a lot of noise externally for corporations to make sweeping statements and bold moves on behalf of their employees and communities. Um, we assessed closely how B2B, which we are considered a B2B business, how B2B and consumer brands were responding and how they differed and what expectations were among our customer base. Uh, with these facts, it really helped demonstrate that comms groups really need a framework on how to address societal issues and contentious topics. This pandemic, along with the social unrest we're experiencing around system, systemic racism, provided the context for us to formalize a societal issues framework for communications. And we assembled a group of senior executives and communication experts who can discuss the issues and assess how and when we should publicly make statements on behalf of the company and on behalf of our CEO. Because you know it's one thing to do the right thing, but then you have to decide if, how, and when you'll talk about what you in fact did. So what did we do? Well, one thing I know we all did, and I'm, I think this includes all of us on, on the line here, is we probably wore out the phrases, these unprecedented times, or these uncertain times, or we're in this together. I know that it, after a while, it's just getting a little hard to find different phrases to sum up what we are living through. Uh, but in all seriousness, as, as in any crisis, we know there's a small window to show our commitment and how we're going to live up to our values uh, of being employee first. So on our approach, first and foremost, I want to highlight that you have to have the right systems in place. Having the right systems, the right framework, the right messaging uh, in place enables you to move faster and to respond quicker. So our approach we assembled the right team, internally and externally. And I can't say enough good about my team. They are amazing. They showed up, and they weren't afraid to get their hands dirty. And I say the same thing about our external partner, Fleischmann Hiller. They really were like a direct extension of our global comms team. 
uh, my team, as I'm sure yours, uh, work tirelessly to create and produce outstanding content, platforms, key messages to support, guide, and protect our employees and our organization at a very uncertain time. Uh, at a time like this, executives look to corporate communications functions to guide the narrative for pivotal events like, like this pandemic, like social unrest, and on and on. Uh, we acted quickly and we iter iterated along the way. Uh, we can all attest that in the early days of COVID-19, every day was different. Every day was different, uh, with exception maybe of the same sweatpants you were probably wearing on your video calls. <laughs> every day was truly different. So we instituted daily stand-up calls using the Agile approach uh, to inform how we collaborated, how we created, and how we iterated during this time. And that was so important um, to, towards moving quickly and efficiently. Uh, we also developed key messaging, as I mentioned before. Uh, we had to develop an escalation plan for social media and inbound inquiries. So we developed the North Star messaging and COVID commandments, as we called it, to guide all communications globally. These key messages supported our marketing and sales teams as they worked to create new solutions during the time and engaged our customers, as well as guided our executives as they communicated both internally and externally. And to provide just a few highlights on the types of communications that we did, on the internal side, in a matter of days, literally, from concept to launch, we went live with a microsite for our employees to get the latest on all COVID-19 communications in real time. Uh, we pre prepared for various uh, scenarios and created comms plans in advance for potential layoffs uh, to temporary site closures, uh, furloughs and the return to work, which we call our comeback plan. We quickly reimagined our executive channels and immediately increased our executives' visibility to our employees in a way that we had never been able to accomplish before. Uh, from weekly videos from our CEO, Bill Meany, to a regular cadence of video-based town halls hosted by our EVPs and SVPs, all while using new technology, G Suite, that we had just launched to the entire company a month prior to the pandemic's start. And this fresh way of communicating for our executives is one part of our comms approach that will stick around for good, and we're glad that it will. Uh, we also celebrated our frontline employees. To have 75% of our employees be uh, frontline employees is so important to us to make sure that we were thanking them for the work that they were doing um, to serve our customers, to serve our um, customers who were, who were essential to helping people through this uh, pandemic. And so we established our hashtag WeAreIM internal campaign and um, showed our support employee to employee. And it was um, a really um, exciting time. We created a, a dedicated co customer content, uh, co dedicated web pages on our external site. And this was to support our customers with thought leadership, with resources, with an understanding of what our solutions are and how it could help them um, as they're trying to navigate their own response to the COVID-19 crisis. And then, of course, as uh, Kathy mentioned, we too had to pivot our event strategy from in-person events to all virtual, literally overnight. Um, and of course, we aggressively monitored social media to track sentiment and inform any additional actions that we had to take publicly or we needed to address uh, internally. And you know, the beauty of all this preparation, the beauty of having the systems and the framework is it helped us as we work to dissuade potentially negative stories in some hotspot markets uh, to really share the positive things that were happening throughout our business. And most of all, we were able to show the resilience of our employees and our business. So finally, we're looking ahead. So what lies ahead? Well, vacation for one thing, but after vacation, in terms of the last few months of, of 2020 and heading into 2021, we're continuing to monitor the COVID-19 situation. Since we, we remain operational as an essential business, we have to stay very close to spikes and, and in the certain states and countries where we operate and have provided a toolkit uh, for offices and to leaders to help them as they reopen and when they need to close um, as needed during this time. 
Uh, we're also working on platforms around growth and innovation and social and racial justice for our top executives. Uh, this really is important to us because we want to make sure that we're telling a really good story around the growth and the positive things happening in our business. Um, not to distract people from the things that do feel very heavy externally, but we're doing it as a way to, to lift up uh, the spirit of, of our, as we call our employees, mountaineers, to help them understand that they're a part of something bigger than themselves and to see the growth uh, trajectory that we have for our company and to also acknowledge the difficult things, the things that we need to say, hey, we need to do better, we can grow, and we, we've we got to do this um, as a company and, and acknowledge where we have our growth area. So telling stories, um, choosing the right stories that we tell is very important um, in this next half of the year. We're uh, fully reimagining our events to be virtual this fall and into the new year uh, with kickoff meetings. And then we're also watching the current issues around the world, uh, making sure that we are prepared and ready to, uh, to respond to those societal issues as they arise. Uh, for us, the key is uh, to work to communicate openly, quickly, and directly in order to demonstrate support to our employees, our customers, and our communities while managing our brand integrity and values as we lead forward. So uh, thank you for having me on this webinar, and I'm going to hand it back to Sarah now. Great, Katie. I'm glad we could get your audio working. That was really great stuff from you and your team at Iron Mountain, so thank you for that. Up next, we have Kelly Lynch. She is um, from Babson College. She's the chief of staff, and she is in the midst of an amazing return to campus. Um, and she's <laughs> gonna walk us through some of what's happening live there right now in Wellesley. So get away, Kelly. Thanks, Sarah. You know, we've been I've been working with just an amazing team here at Babson College to manage our COVID-19 response and planning efforts since early March. Um, and if we can advance to the next slide, just a couple of fun facts. You know, Babson College is based in Wellesley, Massachusetts, but we have satellite operations in both Boston and Miami. Um, we've been ranked the number one school for entrepreneurship for nearly three decades. Um, we are highly international. We have, I think, 30% of our undergraduate population coming from um, all over the world to, to join us. We offer undergraduate programs, graduate programs, programs for both corporations and professionals, um, really to help individuals and organizations think and act more entrepreneurially, no matter where, where they are or what setting or context they're in, so that they can create both economic and social value for themselves, their enterprises, and their communities. Um, you know, we've been working with Fleischman Hillard, I think, for almost 10 years now, right, Sarah? And I just want to say, I don't think we've ever relied more heavily on their partnership than we have in the last six months. Um, and just want to say thank you for the data, the perspective on DE&I that was so helpful to us, the analysis that's been done on um, if, how, when to pitch in these conditions, and even the daily compilation of numbers that was provided to make sure that our teams could focus on their, you know, their highest and best uses for communicating with our own stakeholders and not have to worry about that. Um, can't thank you all enough um, for, for how you've supported um, our operation uh, during this critical time. When you asked Sarah earlier to think about the early days, you're right, it does feel like an absolute lifetime ago, given what we've lived, what we've endured, what we've lost. I think just within the strategic communications industry, you know, losing folks like Larry Rasky, Donna Morrissey, just so painful, journalists who are, are now unemployed, Folks, you know, those those are folks we've been working with for, for years and years and are kind of bedrocks of of this world for us, at least here in, in this media market. Um, and certainly what we've all experienced as a nation, I think we all, you know, all of these panelists, the Fleischman team and everyone on the call really should be incredibly proud of what's been accomplished and the pivots we've all made and the work that's been and done um, to to move forward despite all of this. You know, here at Babson, from the beginning of this global health emergency, we've really had two guiding principles shaping every single decision we made. One, we were gonna safeguard the health and the well-being of our community, that was paramount. And two, we were gonna provide academic continuity. We wanted every single student to be able to make progress toward their degree as if the pandemic was not happening. 
and embedded in those two goals really was a commitment to over communicating. Um, I'm a COO who comes from communications. That's my primary background. Um, and I've been in those circumstances before in other organizations where communications is the tail wagging the dog, actually driving policy decisions to meet the audience's needs for information. Um, and, and also been in that terrible scenario where communications isn't at the table in the design phase on policy and procedure told after the fact and, and left to just communicate, you know, something that really um, wasn't as well thought out. So from the onset of this crisis response for Babson, our communications team has been in every single meeting, every single conversation, and actively shaping the decision-making processes um, so that they can be effectively communicated out to our stakeholders. We were among the first schools, um, here in Massachusetts at least, to announce our decision to shift to 100% online operations in the spring and to say right then and there that we were going to do so for the entire remainder of the spring semester. And I have to tell you, it was frightening for those first kind of 48 hours um, as our community, families, and employees, students reacted to that, had to start to pivot, make their, you know, change all of their plans, shift to online teaching and learning. Um, and we were out ahead of giants like Harvard and others here in our media market. So it put a lot of attention on the Babson decision. Um, but then everyone started to go, right? And then the NBA changed their mind. They stopped their season. Other schools started to announce. Um, and it, all along, though, we knew it was the absolute right thing to do. And we learned a lot in the um, in the spring. In fact, we conducted a daily pulse survey to understand both what our students and faculty were experiencing as they shifted online and did you know worked and taught and learned remotely. Um, and those learnings really um, were important because I think from the get-go we knew that we needed to proceed as if conditions here in Massachusetts and in the US would worsen, not improve with COVID. Um, I know that Kathy mentioned something along those lines earlier, but we actually captured and chronicled our methods, our processes, our decisions, and the outcomes of those decisions during the first um, 120 days of our emergency response and shared that with our entire team to make sure that everything that we had learned from our experience, as painful as it was, would actually help us inform what we would do next. Um, and so on June 30th of this year, we published our return to campus plan. We call it Babson Together. And uh, I have to tell you, that was after an incredibly intense planning effort involving, I think, some two dozen external public health experts and, um, and industry experts as well to help guide us. The plan is some 6,000 words and 28 pages of detail about our health and safety protocols and our approach to academic continuity um, because we wanted to work to not just meet but to actually exceed public health guidance uh, by introducing new protocols um, that would really meet our goals um, but real importantly give our community members um, a strong sense of comfort and confidence in the fact that we could operate um, and work to safeguard um, everyone's health and safety this fall. Um, importantly, I think we recognize the need to really strengthen the value proposition for our students who would be remaining online this fall. Um, it's, a, it's a very different kind of next normal and so we really started to move from uh, a goal of academic continuity to academic excellence. And we did this by investing literally millions of dollars in classroom technology. Every single Babson faculty member was trained to, be, to really excel in online teaching. We had to redesign hundreds of courses to work in both hybrid and fully online models. Um, and we introduced new satellite learning sites as well to, to really create optionality. It was all about flexibility and optionality for the semester to keep our students engaged with us and keep them as lifelong members of the Babson family, um, if at all possible. And this is especially true for our international students, given the visa challenges they were facing. There are still so many embassies, U.S. embassies around the world, that aren't open and aren't able to process those those uh, visa documents that, that students are required to have. And we also had a lot of governmental interference in that, right, in terms of um, shifting policy on on whether or not the U.S. would welcome students from abroad if they were studying um, online and not in a hybrid mode. Um, 
throughout the planning process, if Sarah, if you could, we just go back one slide, you just say that throughout the planning process, you know, again, we were committed to over communicating. So every single member of our community received um, communication from us at least twice weekly. Um, and we held open virtual forums for different stakeholder sets and we were getting upwards of 700 plus people participating in each one of those sessions. Um, and I think one of the important lessons we learned and, and that I would encourage others to consider is, is how openly we shared not just what we were planning but also what we had ruled out and how local, state and federal influences and directives were impacting our plans to help condition folks to the fact that things are changing right underneath our feet every moment every day and so we do need to be agile we do need to pivot and we do need to be a little patient and recognize that you know the plan that we announced on June 30 would continue to be refined enhanced and to evolve um, right up until the day that we started welcoming students and I think that when it was really important and we we derived a lot of value I think from actually not not just to describing the what was in the plan but the why um, and really brought people together um, and helped unify our community uh, through that process. Uh, we also recognize that there's a lot of noise out there right now, right? A uh, lot of different sources for information, a lot of conflicting information um, and it's just hard to reach people um, given the mindset. So we led a fully multimodal modal communications programming, um, email, social websites, even using our RAVE um, emergency notification processes. In person, we went totally grassroots, one-to-one -one calls, um, one-to-one -one, um, sessions to try to make sure that we had everyone on board. Um, right now, I can tell you we are fully operational. We've moved in more than 1,300 students. We've returned all of our student-facing workforce to campus. Uh, we've actually enrolled more students this year than last year, uh, with many of them uh, electing to study either 100% online or, thanks to the optionality we provided, um, to study in different satellite locations we've established around the world. Um, I would share that one of the ways that we're really helping parents, students, faculty, and staff feel as confident as possible about returning to campus is by publishing um, a COVID-19 dashboard. And this offers full transparency into our COVID testing program and its results. And, um, you know, I think we, we look at our academic year began on Monday. Um, classes are in both hybrid mode, face-to-face -face in a de-densified fashion, um, and online as well for students that could not return to campus. Um, and as of next Monday, um, we'll be um, kind of face-to-face -face once both students and faculty have received two negative test results. That was really the threshold that we established. Uh, we've conducted some 3,600 tests um, as of uh, last night and thankfully have only a 0.04 positivity rate. Please keep your fingers and toes crossed for us um, because ultimately we know that the success of our plan resides with our community's willingness to comply with all of these new standards and protocols we're in imposing. Um, so the, the the challenge right now that we're facing and especially in terms of our communications efforts is on one hand our messaging needs to be so insistent on full compliance and impressing on everyone that there are no do-overs with this virus. We really do have one shot to get it right and these first few weeks are critical. Um, but at the same time, you know, think about our audience, our primary audience, 18 to 22 year olds. We have to acknowledge that this next normal is different. It feels different um, and, and for everyone we need to, you know, also balance that strict insistence on compliance with compassion and, and empathy as well. As well. But I would just say that we have great confidence in our plan and, and I think even greater faith in our Babson community to, to get it right and to keep us all safely together this fall. But time will tell, Sarah. You shall see. Every day is a new challenge. <laughs> all right. So I know we are at time. Um, but if you can stay on for five more minutes, if you can't and you need to drop off and go to another meeting or do anything else, Please do that. We will follow up with all attendees with a summary of Diane's um, information that she's going to present now. It's about CEO communications, and I know that's a really important part of the communications as we look into the fall. So if you can stay on, if not, drop off, and we will follow up with an email. So Diane, go for it. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for hanging with me for a couple of minutes. Um, we wanted to close talking a little bit about CEO communications, because I think when you look across the industries that um, spoke to their particular experience on this call, there's one thing that links them all together besides the COVID virus that they're all um, developing plans for. And it's that leadership decision making is really at the center of a lot of the communications challenges their teams are facing. So I just wanted to give a couple of quick minutes about what's the environment your CEO or other business unit leaders might be stepping into right now and a little analysis about the particular pressures that they're facing going into fall. Um, really briefly, this is my nerdy comm theory slide that uh, I'll put you all through for a second. The role of CEO has really fundamentally changed over the last five years or so. I think um, when you look back, it was very clear that um, their job was to make decisions about the business, the business to make sure it was successful, that employees were safe. But over the last four or five years, um, there's been a growing expectation that CEOs are also issue leaders. Um, this is in large part due to this shift to stakeholder capitalism that says, you know, business really can't be successful unless their other stakeholders are successful. And so it's broadened the range of issues that CEOs are expected to weigh in on and not without controversy. Um, I want to make a quick point. Um, if you look on the left side of the slide, there was a New York Times editorial um, a couple of weeks ago that made the claim that CEOs aren't qualified to really lead society, which in a lot of cases is the position they find themselves in. And there are some really great observations in that piece. You know, most of our business leaders today are MBAs. They went to business school. They didn't go to school to think about, um, you know, this multi-stakeholder point of view. Um, so um, they're learning on the fly. They're making decisions by consulting trusted advisors like your communications leaders. Um, and no, there's never been a more important time than now. And I'll say besides the crises that we've talked about on this call today, the 2020 election is putting added pressure on what CEOs say and CEOs do because everything they can, um, that they put out publicly, really can become controversial really quickly. We can switch to the next slide. I want to just give a couple of quick examples about um, some of the pressures and how seemingly um, mundane um, singular business decisions can really become lightning rods in the environment that your CEO and other business unit leaders are facing today. So um, if you see the news article that's spotlighted on the right, it's a headline from um, CNN a couple of weeks ago. And um, it was spotlighting a number of retailers across the country who have gone against the grain and said, hey, we're not going to force our customers or employees to wear masks in stores. And I think the headline is really telling in some ways because it's kind of inflammatory to say, okay, we're prioritizing public health. Why won't these business partners um, step up and say, yes, we're going to make everybody wear a mask coming into our store? Um, there's a, an organization that we heard about. The response was fascinating to me. Um, and he came out in the article and said, we think it's important. We think it's the right thing for employees and for society, but we will not force our employees, our frontline employees in a retail location into a controversial discussion um, that can, has been turning violent with customers by forcing them to wear a mask. And so we will not make it an official policy. It's just one really telling example of the layered decisions that most organizations are having to make right now and how CEOs are having to change their thinking real time to these very complex situations that are laying out in front of them. Um, you can see on the slide, there are a couple of other examples. Um, there's a, an organization that we heard about that came out really strong and social to talk about their role in the supply chain of delivering a vaccine um, when it's ready to the American people. And the leader who posted the photo got hammered because they were seen by some of their stakeholders as um, aligning with the administration on policies that were controversial. Um, so it just kind of goes to show how the lens is really shifting between what might have been a very cut and dry business decision and communication to considering these broad implications. We can move ahead to the next slide because I want to talk a little bit about what does that mean in the landscape for fall. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we came across some really interesting research um, that complements some of the stats Sarah highlighted at the beginning of the slide. Um, and Morning Consult found that 71% of informed consumers and opinion leaders believe that CEOs should be using their power and influence to demand action from government entities to enact systemic change. And they want to hear about the personal opinions of CEOs together with the business decision they're making. So 
I find this really interesting for a lot of reasons, um, but top of mind is that they're demanding more transparency. It's not that you can make a decision for your company or that's based on the profits or welfare of your employees and let it lie. They really want to understand the rationale and the considerations that your companies are making when you come out with a policy decision or weigh in on a societal issue, whether that's social injustice or something related to pandemic management or something related to the election if it comes to your doorstep. Um, so I, I don't want it to all feel like doom and gloom going into the fall because there is some good news here. Um, I think as communicators, we really have the opportunity to pick our moments and some of those moments are coming back in the fall, whereas it was a really quiet landscape um, for CEO and leader voices in some ways in the spring. Um, virtual events are really, they found their stride. And I think if you search online, you know, there's a webinar um, hosted by a really um, reputable media houses and other um, host or organizations happening virtually every week that's talking about the rapidly changing business environment. So there's a chance to tell a story, but also to have a discussion with other leaders about what does it look like going into the future. It's a really great opportunity for thought leadership. Um, another trend that we're seeing is that CEOs are really in demand for business media and podcasts. Um, when we're in this fractured environment for government leadership where there's a lot of contradictory information, um, they're looking to business to step in and say, okay, what's another point of view on the direction we could go to promote safety, security, um, and finding a new normal? And then finally, for those who are um, a little less inclined to external facing opportunities, annual report and end of year letter season is coming up. And I think it's a great opportunity to think really carefully about what it is that you want to say to your stakeholders about what's important in the year forward and why they should have confidence in the decisions that you're making as an organization coming from the top. Um, we can go to the last slide really quickly. Um, you know, I wanted to also share a couple of principles because as we just talked about, none of the decisions you're making as an organization are cut and dry. There's no playbook for how to respond to these ever evolving crises and changing situations. But I think there are some really important principles to consider when putting together a response. You know, what's the tone of the conversation that you're creating? What is the substance of the actions that you're putting behind your communications to show that you really mean it and that you really consider the implications of your decisions? What's the right arc of intention um, that goes behind your storytelling? You might not do everything right the first time, but where are you trying to go? What's the vision for the impact? And then finally, how are you framing um, how business is moving forward? What business as usual looks like as the cycle keeps getting disrupted? All of those things together can help build confidence and help um, create a path forward um, because we don't really know what's going to come up next. And 2020 has been an amazing year for surprises. <laughs> Not sure that's how most people characterize 2020, but we'll go with that, Diane. <laughs> you know, got to keep it positive, otherwise we'll never get there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you running through those slides. Super insightful. So what we want to do now is just wrap it up. We have a quick slide here that um, goes through the five takeaways from today's um, webinar. One more slide or maybe two. Actually, two. We ran out of Q&A time. So the first is plan ahead, but continue to expect it to change. Day to day, things change. Live and communicate your values. That you do what you say. Expect consumer sentiment to quickly shift and evolve, and that's why we always do our data-driven insights. Continue to prioritize employees. They are people, and we are all in the same storm from both. And start planning for 2021. I know it is end of August. It is hard to think about January in 2021, but now is the time to plan um, so that you can get ahead of any of the issues um, coming up next year. <laughs> so I thank all of you and all of our panelists for your time. We will be sending out a recording to today's webinar. We will also follow up with some data for the folks that couldn't stay on since we went 11 minutes over. So I uh, appreciate you sticking with us and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.